I had an encounter with a Wendigo in the main woods while I was hunting. Edit to add full story. This happened when I was hunting several years ago. It was November of either 2015 or 2016. I went out hunting with my grandfather in a patch of woods, not incredibly far from his house. I met him on the road by where we usually park to go in. We loaded up, figured out a plan for where to post and what we'd do and set off into the woods. For those that like visualizing the best they can, this was a fairly dense section of woods bordered on two sides by roads. The hill I usually posted on sat and waited for deer was met by a large swamp on the bottom. I got to my spot and my grandfather went deeper into the woods. It had already snowed that month so the ground was covered with snow and more snow was due to fall that dew, but we figured we'd be out before it started. After being set up for a few hours the woods went dead silent. This usually only happens when a predator is around. I perked up and started looking around just to make sure I wasn't the target. I started hearing a crunching and squishing sound from down the hill from me. As I stood up and looked I saw a seven eight foot tall emaciated creature ripping something apart and eating it. The creature and the ground around it were covered in blood which contrasted with fresh snow. At this point I audibly said, what the F, and it cocked its head and began to turn and look at me. Terrified, I raised up my rifle and fired three rounds at the creature. It screamed the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life and dropped its meal and took off towards the swamp. I'm sure I hit it at least once, but seemingly I only pissed it off. I immediately called my grandfather on his cell, and before I could even say anything, he said, Stay where you are, I'm coming to you. We're leaving. Now. My grandfather was and still is an avid hunter and outdoorsman. He resembles a mountain man. Hearing that in his voice put me on an even higher alert because there was no risk of me misinterpreting what I had seen. He reached me pretty quickly and we hauled ass out of the woods. When we got to the vehicles we heard one last distant scream and that was it. He never acknowledged what we had both heard and I had seen and nowadays he just says he was cold and was tired of being out there that day. I have never seen anything even remotely close to that before or since. I know the story sounds crazy, and if I hadn't been there, I wouldn't believe it either. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer it. I still hunt. I just make sure I'm out of the woods well before sundown now. Second edit. The Wendigo was roughly seven, eight feet tall. Emaciated with a distended belly pale white skin that was both stretched tight and saggy, with long claw-like fingers and deep eye sockets with pure black eyes. Late to the party, so this will probably get buried, but many years ago, a friend stopped by from out of town and brought a hefty dose of LSD with them. Beautiful summer night, so we drop a few tabs and decide to go for a hike. A half mile from my house is a river with a trail leading through the woods to a cemetery. In high school, there were always stories of Satan worshippers using this cemetery and tales of a witch's grave. There are also creepy ass cairns spaced out in the woods behind the cemetery. I've walked through the place many times and never seen anything suspicious, just a peaceful place to spend some time. I found the supposed witch's grave, though. Just another grave to me. Anyway, heads full of acid. We're heading up the narrow path leading to the cemetery in the dark, when out of nowhere like eight hooded figures walk past us in the opposite direction. We never heard them coming. One second they're there, the next they're gone. They don't look at us or say anything, just walk past with their heads down. My buddy and I give each other the old what the F look shrug and continue on. We make our way through the woods into the cemetery. Start to peek. It's fully dark now, and we're walking down one of the side paths trying to find the witch's grave, which is proving difficult considering the trip and the darkness. Suddenly, a hundred feet or so ahead of us, multiple lights spring into being, maybe a dozen of them, and just hover. We stop immediately and look at each other, Confirm that we're both seeing this, and it's not just a hallucination. And then, as we're watching, 
freak the F out. They very abruptly scatter in all directions, disappearing into the cemetery. Time to go. We do an about face and start double timing it toward my place, keeping our heads on a swivel. For the first couple minutes, there's nothing. Then, randomly off in the woods, we'd see a single light flash on, only to disappear seconds later. Then a few more. Sounds of running and heavy breathing are coming from the woods. They're all around us. We're walking faster and faster, no longer giving an F about what's happening, just wanting to get away. I'm trying to think through the acid, but all I can come up with is that the Satan worshippers have summoned the alien overlords, and I'm pretty sure we're going to be sacrificed to them at any moment. We turn down the final path out of the cemetery. I can see the gates and the street beyond, and I start thinking we might actually make it out. Then a dark hooded figure steps out from behind a mausoleum to our left, and a brilliant light blinds us. It's a man. In a solemn, deadly calm voice, he says, you're it. We're frozen. No idea how to proceed. Finally, my buddy stutters. What? You're not with us, are you? The man replies. Uh, no man, we're not with you. He lowers his hood. It's a kid. Like a teenager, but still, just a kid. Turns out he's playing flashlight tag with his buddies. He apologizes in his manly voice for bothering us, turns off his light, and runs back into the cemetery to rejoin his friends. So yeah, that was a fun night. Here's a brief story of an alien interaction with a horse, told to me by my dad when I was a kid. My dad was a former jockey, still into horses, horse breeding, and thoroughbreds. This happened before I was born. Dad was working on a thoroughbred stud farm. They had a champion pregnant mare, so the foal was valuable. The horse was in a paddock by herself away from other animals like dogs, dingoes, and kangaroos. It was an old bush paddock with a pile of old cars stacked up in a corner and high fencing to prevent animals or people from getting in or out. I believe the stud farm was in a town called Scone in the Hunter Valley area of New South Wales, Australia. One night a police officer from the neighboring valley reported some lights in the sky. He followed them as far as he could. The next morning dad and another guy went to check on the mare to see if it had gone into foal overnight. They found the mare. She had had the foal, but there was no foal or afterbirth anywhere. There was a large ring burnt into the ground and the paint on the old cars had been burnt off on the sides facing the ring. Dad also said nothing grew in that ring for a long time. Dad passed away about 13 years ago, so I can't get any more information. My cousins used to tell me stories when I was young about Yowies and Aussie Bigfoot. They told me that Queen Yowie used to ride a chopper. I didn't know what they looked like. I pictured black ghosts on bikes. Ghosts like in the Scooby-Doo cartoons. Here's a story or two about a ghost in an old building. The building was going to be a church, but it wasn't finished. A priest shot through with the money. The church was turned into a nightclub. I started as a busboy, then barman, and then basically as the bar manager. I opened up and did all the kegs, alcohol, and money. This club, building had a bit of a reputation as having a ghost. People would say they'd see a figure upstairs, when they were downstairs, and a glimpse into a large mirror behind the DJ booth. One night I asked a female bussy to work upstairs as we were busy. I went up to see if she needed anything. She didn't notice me standing at the end of the counter, so I flicked a plastic shot glass near her. She took off running back down the stairs. At the end of the nights, we'd have knockoff drinks. Security had kicked everyone out, so the bar staff and security would have a chat and drink. One night the drinks were at a corner bar downstairs, we had three downstairs. One upstairs when all the glasses and a few bottles were smashed upstairs. Everyone took off. We knew no one was up there. We used to operate another nightclub as well. Not open at the same time, though. That night I was asked to go to the haunted club to get some alcohol and money. I drove to the club and went in the side door. 
In total darkness, I had to make my way to the front door, turn off the silent alarm, and turn on a few lights. I then had to go out the back the the cage to get the alcohol I needed, then upstairs to the safe. Once that was all done, I had to turn off the lights, turn on the alarm, and get out. I'd been in there plenty of times by myself during the night and day. That night, something felt different. As I turned the lights off and the alarm on, I walked past the entrance to the toilets. I felt like something was there. I turned and looked. It was pitch dark, but there was a darker spot that seemed to move. It made me move, and I couldn't wait to get out. I stumbled down some stairs and tried to calm myself thinking I was being stupid. I found myself hurrying again to get out and lock up. I was living with my girlfriend in a nice little neighborhood that I later learned was in the wrong part of town. I walked by myself most nights, talking on the phone with my aunt as I did slow laps around the subdivision. That night, I had looped around the whole place once or twice and was about 15 minutes away from home. I can remember that moment very well. I was on the sidewalk, crossing a driveway beneath a lamp post that lit up the nearby house, when I heard what was very clearly a dog growling from up the driveway, near the garage door. I grew up with big dogs, Rotties, Pits, and Germans. I know how territorial they are, and I know that they can sometimes become more aggressive if you look at them. So I kept my head down and kept walking at the same pace, expecting that the dog would ignore me after I walked by. I told my aunt that there was a dog nearby, and she got really quiet. A lot of things went through my mind, but my brain just kept focusing on one thought. Don't run. Just don't run. Whatever you do. Punch, kick, scream, but don't run. I heard its collar jangle as it got up and I could hear it trotting slowly behind me to catch up. I looked over my shoulder and saw two thick Rottweilers staring straight at me, walking next to each other on the sidewalk about ten feet behind. I told my aunt that I'd call her back, but she refused to get off the phone. I walked, and they followed me. The next ten minutes were the most terrified I have ever felt. In the moment, I was sure that they could tell how scared I was. By the time I turned onto the street where I lived, I was in tears. After she gave up on asking questions, my aunt kept telling me, It'll be okay. Just keep walking and stay calm. Can't say for sure I would have stayed calm without her. Those dogs followed me all the way to my front door, growling the whole time. I've lived with Rottweilers bigger than them, and never felt like I was in any danger. But something instinctual told me that night that those dogs wanted to hurt me. I know for sure that I was not safe around them. Funny thing was, I drove by that house every day for almost a year and never saw those dogs again. I continued to walk at night and never encountered anything similar. I used to walk my dog Buon Anima up in the access roads for the power lines in the town. They're probably two, three miles long, have a lot of ledges and obstacles. You have a nice view of the town below. It's just a nice place to walk your dog or jog or whatever. It was technically a restricted area on at the entries on either side, but people with houses around them could easily walk in through the woods as I did. I'd see other people here and there walking their own dogs or jogging, but usually the same people. But it wasn't common to see people. So one day I'm walking my dog Big Black Lab. He was almost 120 pound but burly, not fat at all, but also the nicest and gentlest boy you'd ever meet. And he stops dead in his tracks and his ears perk up and he starts sniffing. Then he looks around behind me and starts staring. So I turn around and I see a disheveled, raggedy-looking man sprinting toward us, probably 250 feet away. Then, when he sees me see him, he literally stops dead in his tracks and starts walking, as if I didn't just see him sprinting at me, and he's trying to hide that he was just doing that. Now, I'm not at all trying to say I wasn't creeped, because I was, but with me fight, flight is pretty much always fight. 
So my brain starts going and I decide the smart thing to do is stay put and not run. Let whoever this is know I have no reason to be afraid. So he approaches to talking distance and I wait for him to say something. I just stare at him holding the clip on the dogs who is doing that soft, angry growl, or the hair on his back is standing up, by the way, and he never growled at anyone. So now my guard is through the roof leash. Big dog man, he says, he bite, not as long as he's on the leash, I say, subtly playing with the clip on the leash with my thumb. Oh, hey, I'm looking for generic store. Is it that way? And he points. Yay. I say. So he walks off and I stood there watching him get way beyond any distance that he could run and catch up to me again. What he wanted I have no clue, but I'm guessing to club me in the back of the head and rob me. But my boy had my back. The sun hung low in the sky, casting long shadows across the dense forest as I, an inexperienced hunter, trudged through the underbrush. I had always wanted to impress my father with my hunting skills, and this trip was my chance to prove myself. Little did I know that this day would change my life forever. As I made my way deeper into the woods, I spotted movement in the distance. My heart raced as I cautiously approached my rifle trembling in my inexperienced hands. Through the trees, I saw what appeared to be a rare and endangered species, a majestic creature I couldn't quite identify. Without thinking, I raised my rifle and fired. The shot rang out through the forest, and the creature let out a heart-wrenching cry before collapsing to the ground. Horror washed over me as I realized what I had done. I had just shot a creature on the brink of extinction, and I knew the consequences could be severe. Panicking, I rushed to the fallen animal. It was unlike anything I had ever seen. Over long arms hung nearly to its feet, except that eight-inch claws jutted out from its long-haired fingers instead of fingernails. The creature was hairy all over with a sheen, silver-like hair, and it had human-like hairy feet, almost size 35. But what truly baffled me was its head which resembled more that of a grizzly bear with a shorter but deeply scarred snout. These scars hinted at untold battles with beings even larger than itself. Yet, those piercing blue eyes projected a sense of ancient experience. Tears welled up in my eyes as I knelt beside the fallen creature. I felt a profound sense of guilt and remorse for what I had done. I knew I had to hide the evidence to avoid the consequences so I dragged the lifeless body deeper into the woods and concealed it under a pile of fallen leaves and branches. Just as I finished hiding the evidence, I heard a rustling in the bushes nearby. My heart leaped into my throat as I turned to see a sight that sent chills down my spine. Emerging from the shadows was another creature, one even more terrifying than the one I had shot. It had those same overlong arms, claws, and the grisly bear-like head. Frozen with fear, I watched as the creature's piercing blue eyes locked onto me. It emitted a guttural growl that seemed to vibrate through the very ground beneath my feet. Without warning, the creature began to charge toward me, its powerful legs propelling it forward with astonishing speed. In a blind panic, I turned and sprinted through the dense forest. My heart pounded in my chest as I heard the creature's heavy footsteps closing in behind me. Branches scratched at my face, and roots threatened to trip me at every turn. I had never run so fast in my life, driven by pure terror. As I reached the edge of the forest, I burst into a clearing, gasping for breath. I looked back, but saw no sign of the creature. Had I lost it? Or had it given up the chase? I couldn't be sure. I stumbled out of the woods and into our campsite, where my father and the rest of the hunting party were waiting. They could see the fear in my eyes and the dirt on my clothes. What happened, son? My father asked, concerned. I tried to catch my breath and compose myself. I... I saw something out there, something I can't explain. It was a creature, like nothing I've ever seen before. And when I shot it, another one came after me. I barely escaped with my life. 
The other hunters exchanged worried glances. My father put a reassuring hand on my shoulder. We'll figure this out, son. We'll go back in the morning and see if we can find any trace of these creatures. That night, as we sat around the campfire, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that had settled over me. I knew what I had seen was real, and I knew that no one would believe me. I swore to myself that I would never forget that day in the forest, no matter how unbelievable it may seem. It was a story I would carry with me for the rest of my life, a true story of a hunter who had accidentally crossed paths with something beyond my wildest imagination. Logically, next morning we didn't find any trace of this creature. True story. Scariest thing that's ever happened to me was getting surprised by a moose. I was snowshoeing here in Colorado, and I didn't notice the big guy lying in the snow behind some trees until he stood up. He stood up when I got right next to him like within arm's reach. I don't know if you've ever seen a moose, but they're big. If they don't want you there, you're not going to be. He definitely didn't like me there, and I immediately backed off. Only thing that really helped me was the fact that there were a few trees between us he had to walk around. If you've never snowshoed, it's a bit clumsy. Imagine trying to calmly walk backwards without falling into deep snow, while a big angry moose is trotting towards you and you're wearing flippers. One wrong step and I'm getting stomped. By the time he gets around the trees, I'm a solid 15 feet away. Still too close, but far enough that he lets me continue to back off. I've run into many animals, including bears and a big cat of some kind. This is the first time I truly felt an imminent danger. It doesn't happen while hiking, but it did happen late at night, and it was near an area frequented by hikers. It is still the oddest and creepiest things that happened to me despite being 15 years ago. I was 19 at the time and was driving late at night in the desert. I was going around a bend when I noticed something sitting in the middle of road. When I was still not close enough for my headlights to reflect the object, so it looked like some sort of large cat sitting in the road eating something. Except, when I finally got close enough to actually see it, it was not just a cat. It looked like some sort of cat-human hybrid human face with cat ears, eyes that glowed when it looked into my lights. Long limbs and patches of fur are the biggest things I remember. The thing immediately ran off on all fours when it noticed me. That messed me up for a while. I had heard stories of creatures that were mutated by radiation from government experiments back in the 40s, but had never really believed them. One time, a few years ago, I had some free time in the fall, so I went to the woods for a couple days. I sleep under a tarp because I enjoy building the shelter, and I use the fallen leaves as a sleeping pad. One night, I heard some leaves rustling 30 or 40 feet away from camp. When I heard it, I figured it was a squirrel or something, but then it made a beeline for me. I heard much more defined steps and my heart drops. Whatever it is, it's coming closer and closer, and it's sprinting. I couldn't see a thing, but when it got maybe 10 feet from my shelter, it just runs off in the other direction. Scared the absolute shit out of me. Never felt such a primal fear like that before. Could it be a Bigfoot? Camping in the woods with my ex, she wakes me up around 3 a.m. whispering that there's a noise outside, something touching the van. I beeped the horn and a loud noise sounded like a bunch of feet running away. Managed to go back to sleep. Wake up around 7 to start breakfast and exit the tent to find a bunch of footprints around the tent and van, as well as what looked like claw marks on the trunk and side doors of the van. We left later that day instead of staying the last two days of our trip.
It was the summer of 2015 and I was in 12th grade. Me and two other friends went on the camping trip in Alberta, Canada. The drive up was normal. We got to the campsite. And oh yeah, one of my friends who we will call Jeff brought his girlfriend who we will call Jane. So when we pulled up to our camp spot, we unloaded our gear, then had lunch. And then we went on for a hike. Around three o'clock, we came back around 515. And for about four hours, we sat around the campfire telling stupid stories and other stuff like that. But this is when this gets too real. We started to get the feeling we were being watched, which is weird because there was no one around us for about a whole kilometer. So we thought it just might be a fellow camper. So I yelled out, hey, but no response. So we just ignored it. Later that night, I woke up to the sound of snapping twigs. I looked out of the tent curiously, and what I saw was a creature about 20 meters away from the tent. It was about eight feet tall with nut brown hair, and that's all I could really see in the moonlight. So I woke up my friend, and he went pale. He slowly closed the tent zipper and looked at me and said it's right outside. I told them that's impossible because it was just 20 meters away. I found this old report and I thought you would find it of interest. The lieutenant is anonymous, but his sighting is horrible sounding at 4.15 on the morning of July 18, 1944. While acting as the officer and tactical command of a nine-ship anti-submarine task force stationed about 200 miles east of Yokosuka, Japan, I witnessed an incredible encounter with what I believe to be a large sea monster or giant octopi. A destroyer on our starboard side began firing at what was estimated to be about a 70-foot-long creature about 2,000 yards away from our ship. The destroyer's gunner reported that the monster suddenly dove at the destroyer, stove in its bow with one sweep of its massive tentacles, and submerged again. When it resurfaced shortly thereafter, moving out ahead of the destroyer, it turned at right angles and caused the ship to list 30 degrees. At that point, the destroyer ceased firing for fear of striking our own ship. I had once directed another destroyer, which was on our port side, to fire with its five-inch guns on the monster, having no effect other than further damage to the superstructure of our sister ship. The attacking monster submerged and appeared to be moving away from the starboard side of our ship. When it resurfaced on our port side, I turned my ship directly toward the monster's position, opened fire with all battery weapons, including five-inch guns, 40-millimeter anti-aircraft guns, 20-millimeter machine guns, and finally, four-inch rockets, which were the only weapons available that had a chance of a hit. The rockets were fired in pairs from each turret. When they struck the water, I observed with my own eyes that they skipped like flat stones skimming across the water. One pair of rockets struck the monster's head, which had once disappeared beneath the waves. A second later, two more pairs struck the water where it had just submerged and I saw large columns of reddish-brown liquid rise to about 50 feet in the air, followed by an explosion which made the ship tremble just slightly. The attacking monster was never seen again. I was hiking one night with my wife in an urban wilderness hiking area of our hometown. It's essentially a large area of the city that's uninhabited and owned by the city parks department and turned into hiking and biking trails. We arrived at dusk one evening and there were no other cars in the parking lot. We began our night hike and about 45 minutes into the hike, it was pitch black. We were hiking down a trail and turned a corner when we heard a very low and unnerving growl. We immediately stopped and I shined my flashlight in the direction we heard it come from about five yards away. We couldn't see anything. We stood there for a few moments to see if we could hear it again, and sure enough it got louder. It sounded deep and large, almost like a lion was growling at us. It was very startling. We never saw anything but ended up booking it the opposite direction, literally sprinting back to the parking lot. I've never ran so fast. 
After getting back to the car and gathering our wits, we heard distant motorcycles driving down the road. They sounded similar to the growl we heard. I tried making sense of it. Was it the motorcycles or an animal? The only native animal large enough to make a deep growl like that would maybe be a mountain lion. We don't have any other large animals around here capable of making that sound. I know there are a few mountain lions here and there in the surrounding rural areas where I live, but in city limits, no way. I'm still baffled about it. Hiking in central Maine, near the 100-mile wilderness section of the AT, about as thinly populated as you can get in the lower 48. Wife and I pull up to the trailhead at about 2 a.m. after a long drive in epic storms and decide to catch a few Zs before hitting the trail at sunrise. After settling in, we notice a blinking light on a distant mountain. There's no illumination for miles and miles in any direction, so it sticks out immediately and comment on it likely being the only radio tower for 50 miles. Then the light starts slowly moving down the hill. It's maybe a couple miles off, and we both get interested. We figure it must be some truly insane bastard coming down the mountain in the darkest part of night with a headlamp, and the blinking is when a tree obscures line of sight. It keeps coming and picks up speed, and at this point we start to make casual jokes that it's coming right towards us. I can't remember how long we had the car's lights off, but at this point we turn them back on as we're starting to feel a little creepy. We watch the light come down the hill, covering the couple miles in a minute. Maybe two. Then it's right outside about 20 feet off the ground and blinking. We grab a flashlight to try to see what it is, but can see nothing. It's just a blinking light about the brightness of a dim street light appearing every few seconds. It hovered there for around 20 minutes, then was suddenly gone. To this day, we have no idea what it was. I assume some kind of giant glowy bug, but I've lived in the country most of my life and have never seen anything that bright or a bug move that fast. This event occurred in Northwestern Ohio in the summer of 2018. I was camping with my brother along Lake Erie near the Pickerel Creek Wildlife Area just west of our home in Sandusky, Ohio. So, that first night, we went to sleep early. I woke up at around 2.30 a.m. because I had to take a leak. My brother was fast asleep. The moon was almost full that night, so it gave off plenty of light for me to see everything outside the tent. There weren't many bushes in the area around our campsite, so I didn't have to worry or be afraid of something hiding and waiting to sneak up on me. I was walking away from our camp when I saw something that scared the crap out of me not far from me. There were two dog-like creatures just standing there staring at me. When I say standing, I mean on two legs. I completely freaked out and I started running back to the tent. I heard what sounded like they were chasing after me and making the strangest noises. Not so much a dog or wolf sound, but more of something like a human. It was the scariest sound I had ever heard. I was too afraid to turn around. I thought that at any second they would pounce on me and attack, but that never happened. When I did make it back to the tent, I dove into it. I scared the crap out of my brother, who asked what was going on. I told him what had just happened. He gave me a strange look and then laughed, telling me to shut up. I told him if he didn't believe me to go out there himself and see. He laughed again and said, sure thing, I have to go anyway. So I sat there and I watched him stand up and head out of the tent. I knew that this was serious and I couldn't let him go out there by himself. So I followed him out of the tent and into the darkness. My eyes took a few seconds to adjust, but I could see him standing about 20 yards away staring off at the trees. I walked over next to him and I looked in that direction too. We were staring into pitch black woods, but then as my eyes adjusted, I could see something in the shadows. It was a part dog, part man creature. It didn't move or growl, it just stood there upright and looking at us. The dog part, the upper half, looked like a German shepherd, 
but with yellow eyes and a dog-like head. The human part started about mid-torso downward. It was standing there on two legs like a man. The upper part was hairy like a dog, but the bottom half was hairless like a human man. I whispered to my brother and asked what he thought it was. He said nothing. He was literally paralyzed with fear and shock. I grabbed him and pulled him back to the tent. As we ran back, the creature let out a horrific howl. The sound of that thing echoed through the trees. It was like nothing I had ever heard before. We dove into the tent and piled our backpacks and gear in front of the entrance, as if this would offer us protection. We were both absolutely terrified. He was shaking and I felt like I had to throw up. I asked him what we should do now and he said that he didn't know, but if this thing got in our tent, it would kill us for sure. Then we heard a dog howl in the distance and we started to feel relieved, even though I knew that it may have been the second creature that I had encountered earlier. Then it was answered by another howl closer to us like, right outside the tent, it had followed us. We then heard scratching and digging sounds. We were both screaming hysterically at this point. Then it stopped and there was nothing but silence. We waited inside the tent for at least 15 minutes, hoping that it had left. We decided to risk it and peek outside the tent. I grabbed the flashlight and peeked through the flap. I saw nothing. I waited a bit longer, but then I looked out into the campsite. There was nothing there. We decided to stay put in the tent until daylight. There was no way that we were going to walk through the dark woods toward my car in an attempt to escape these creatures. After what seemed like forever, the morning light started creeping through the forest canopy. We both slowly exited the tent and looked around us. There were large canine and human-like prints all around the campsite, especially in a circle around the tent. We quickly gathered all of our gear and started to hike quickly toward my car, which was parked in a lot about a half mile away. When we reached the car, the first thing that I noticed was a terrible stench. I didn't know what it was, but the odor was very strong. It was so strong that we smelled it after we got it and drove off. My brother believes that the creatures may have found the car and marked it as theirs. I wasn't sure if that was true, but the stench lingered in the car for days. When I got home, after dropping my brother off at his apartment, I started looking online in an attempt to find answers. I read several accounts about dogman sightings throughout Ohio, but none were from the area where we had been. That was five years ago. My brother and I still enjoy the outdoors but we have not returned to the area of our encounter. We are both more aware of our surroundings when hiking and camping, but we just do not talk about the encounter with each other. Used to go on holiday to the south of France every year with my parents. They were big into walking and seeing the surrounding areas so my sister, and I would always be dragged along with them. There was one time we had stopped to eat dinner at the top of a mountain, probably one of the longest walks we'd been on since my sister and I were only around 10 and 12 years old. Whilst we were sat on some boulders eating, this old French lady, probably around 70 years old, approached my parents and asked if they could show her the way down the mountain as she was looking for her husband. Bear in mind, this was a very isolated spot, and we hadn't seen any other people on this entire walk. My parents were confused how such an elderly old lady had made it so far up the mountain in such heat and no hiking gear. They attempted to communicate with her and see if she had any explanation of how she got there, but she insisted that she just needed to find her husband. As we started walking back down the mountain, she began to follow us. All of my family were wearing hiking boots and using sticks to aid us in our descent, as the path was incredibly steep and we all slipped many times. The old lady, however, did not struggle. She followed us down without misplacing a step. The creepiest thing about her, though, was that the entire way down all she would say was ooh la la any time any of my family slipped or seemed to struggle finding the right place to put our feet. Once we reached the bottom of the mountain and were on the path back to the car park, 
She said thank you and began following the path we had taken to get to the top of the mountain. She is now referred to in my family as the Ulala woman. This happened to me in the early 2000s. It was nearing 4.45 a.m., and I was taking some time by the Willamette River before stores opened. I was living in Eugene, Oregon. The spot I chose to stop and rest was next to the famous Owen Rose Garden Park and Interstate 5 ran overhead. I was underneath and next to the river. It was springtime and the temperature was cold but not freezing. I put my back against one of the support beams from the highway and rested. That's when I noticed some strange things going on across the river from where I was maybe 50 feet on the bank. I saw two tall, thin but very muscular, mantis insect beings on the other bank. I'm nauseated writing this now. The first one was less than 10 feet from the water's edge, not moving at all but eyes were open glassy like mirrors. There was a person there, on the ground, face down and looking like maybe he fell. Then I noticed the second hellion. I hadn't noticed him before because he wasn't all that clear. This creature was beating forward and back really quickly. He was leaning over another body. The body didn't move, but this thing did. Very fast. A blur, actually. I became afraid at this point and slid my butt forward so my head and vision would go down. That's when I heard strange talking. I also heard the banging of metal on concrete. I looked up I didn't want to and saw what looked like a white, bald man with big black sunglasses. He was looking from behind the pillar barely 15 feet away from me. We just looked at each other, and then I began sliding down as far as I could go and not see him. I thought to myself, the hell with this. I gathered my courage and jumped up, grabbed my bike, and began riding as fast as I could in order to get away. Right after I started riding, I started throwing up. It was way too much for me. But then something flashed right by me in hyper speed. All I saw was this disturbance in the air. I said out loud, what the hell was that? To feel safe, I ended up at our hospital sitting in the air lobby. There was a car going around and around the block until about 6, 6.30 a.m. The windows were fogged, but I could see three outlines. Were they lost? I'm not sure. I went back two days later, and there was nothing to stand on behind the pillar of the guy with glasses. The pillar goes right into the river. Also, I couldn't find any tracks on the other side, but it did look dug up, like a dozer or something. There were also others in line, going up to the highway. I couldn't figure out where they were going, My family and I have always been drawn to the great outdoors. There's something about the call of the wilderness that stirs our souls. I, Mark, have a passion for hiking, instilled in me by my own father. My wife, Lisa, cherishes the tranquility of nature, and our two children, Emily and Jake, are growing up with a deep love for the woods. One crisp autumn morning, we decided to embark on a hiking adventure deep into the heart of a secluded forest. The towering pines, vibrant foliage, and the promise of a peaceful escape from the hectic city life filled us with excitement. We loaded our pickup truck with camping gear, provisions, and our faithful Labrador, Max. The forest was known to be remote, untouched by modern conveniences, and it was exactly what we were looking for. After hours of driving on winding, unpaved roads, we reached the trailhead. Tall trees blocked the sun, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. The air was crisp, carrying the earthy scent of moss and leaves. It was exactly as we had hoped an escape from the chaos of our daily lives. We started our hike with me leading the way, Lisa and the kids in tow, and Max, the excited dog, bounding ahead, barking with joy. The trail led us deeper into the woods, and with each step, we felt the modern world slipping away. As the day wore on, we marveled at the natural beauty surrounding us. The vibrant reds and oranges of the leaves, the babbling brooks, and the chirping of birds filled our senses. 
We paused by a clear, babbling creek to enjoy a simple picnic lunch, our laughter echoing through the serene forest. But as the sun dipped below the horizon and the forest grew dark, the atmosphere changed. The trees seemed to close in, their rustling leaves now ominous whispers. I checked my GPS, which showed that we were miles from the nearest trailhead or civilization. Then, we heard it a distant, eerie cry that sent shivers down our spines. Max, our usually fearless companion, whimpered and retreated closer to the family. The forest, once so inviting, now felt like a realm of unknown danger. Our unease deepened when we stumbled upon a clearing. In the center stood a creature that defied explanation. It was taller than the pickup by easily a couple of feet. Its body was black, surrounding the white of the bones, with long arms half stretched to its sides, as if it was saying, try and hit me. It was definitely three-dimensional, tall with long arms and dark, dead looking, like light was sucked into it without reflecting anything. Its face was a haunting deer skull, devoid of eyes, but with empty sockets that seemed to seep darkness. The creature exuded an aura of malevolence that paralyzed us with fear. Before we could react, the creature lunged at us with unearthly speed. Panic surged through our family as we turned and sprinted back into the woods. The predator pursued us relentlessly, its eerie cries echoing through the trees. My instincts kicked in, and I led my family deeper into the forest, veering off the trail to evade our pursuer. We navigated through the dense underbrush, branches snapping and leaves crunching beneath our feet. Emily and Jake clung to Lisa and me, tears streaming down their faces. Hours passed and exhaustion weighed us down, but we dared not stop. We could still hear the creature behind us, its presence a constant threat. With the moon high in the sky and our bodies pushed to the limits, our family found a small cave, its entrance partially hidden by overgrown shrubs. We squeezed inside, our hearts pounding, and remained huddled in the darkness, praying that the creature had lost our trail. Outside the cave, we could hear the guttural growls and rustling of leaves as the predator searched for us. Hours turned into a long, restless night as we listened to its haunting cries echoing through the forest. But the creature's presence eventually faded, and the forest fell silent. Exhausted and terrified, we allowed ourselves a fitful sleep, our dreams haunted by the bone-chilling encounter. I went camping with my RV by myself way out in the middle of nowhere in north-central Pennsylvania. Drove on dirt forest service roads for over an hour, and then hiked about six miles in on a barely recognizable trail. There were no signs anyone had been in the area recently. The trail was almost completely overgrown, no footprints, spiderweb everywhere, etc. I didn't really have a planned stopping point. I was just looking for a nice place to camp. But the trail followed a creek in a valley and was very rocky and not flat. As the sun is starting to set, I came upon a fork in the creek with a nice flat spot just on the other side. As I got closer, I saw all sorts of stuff laying about. I crossed the creek and started looking around. There was a tarp on the ground by a stone fire ring, a log about a foot in diameter that had been chopped with an axe. A little bit away I found the entire contents of what you would imagine to find in a hiker's backpack, food, cooking set, camping pad, first aid kit, etc. all strewn about on the ground, but no backpack in sight. There was a pile of clothes down by the creek that looked like it had sat through the last rain, which was the day prior, and a towel hanging from a tree. There was an area that had clearly been used as a toilet, for maybe 10-14 days based on the amount of toilet paper piles. The strangest thing, though, was this cage about four foot square, made out of saplings tied together. It was framed where the edges of a cube would be, and then had crossbars diagonally on each face. But it wouldn't have kept anything inside because of how much open space there was, and obviously wouldn't have been very sturdy since it was only made from saplings. I ended up deciding to set up camp there because it was nearly dark 
and I didn't really have much choice unless I wanted to hike out in the dark on an unrecognizable trail. I had a 12-inch knife on me and I kept that thing in one hand the whole time I was there, thinking some crazy guy was gonna jump out and try to eat me. All night I barely slept and kept thinking I was hearing things, and then as soon as the sun came up I packed up and got the F out of there. Everything turned out fine, no crazy cannibals or anything. But it still really bugs me because I don't know what that stupid wooden cube frame cage thing was. I called the forest service for the area and told them about it, even sent them pictures. They said they'd send a ranger in to check it out and clean it up, but I never followed up to see if they figured out what it was. The ranger on the phone told me it was probably either someone with a still nearby, someone growing pot, or just some loner living out in the woods. I roamed up the sides of the valley before I set up camp and didn't see anything. A still seems unlikely because of how far you would have to carry equipment in, and the area isn't really great for growing pot. So maybe it was just some guy living out in the woods. But why the cage? If there's any interest, I can probably find the pictures. Oh yeah, and last year I was camping out in Colorado and woke up at about 2 a.m. to a pack of coyotes running through my camp howling. Sounded like at least 20 of them. My dog was asleep next to me the entire time. Probably best he didn't wake up though, he would have gone nuts. And I'm told coyotes are much bolder in packs. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.